here on the campus of Birmingham and well the first half of my research masters is done just about so it's time for me to go to a new place I'm going to London for the six months and as I'm moving and I should have more of a job style of approach so evenings and weekends free I was thinking it's time for me to put more energy into this channel and also time for me to think about how having a new environment with new people will affect how I think because the environments we work in very much affect what ideas we have. Mm. So, the environments we work in do affect how we think. We like to think of science as being objective. For example, we can just look at an object and figure out what it's made of and what it does. So, for example, we take my bear uh, It's made of wool, it's of a certain size, and if we know that hats exist, then we can recognise that this is probably a hat. Again, if we look at a different bearing. So, what happens when we don't know what a thing is, or we can't even really conceive of it? Um, this is a thing that I've been thinking about a lot. Like, what things do I think are impossible that are actually possible? And, well, that's important for a scientist to know. when we don't know what's possible and we're trying to do the guesswork part of science, coming up with theories and ideas to explain nature, reality, or even mathematics. Uh, and I think it's an underappreciated problem how the social environments we are in reflect on the kind of ways we think. Uh, and so I like to think about that. I'm moving to a new place, I'll be talking to new people, and I will be thinking differently, and I'm hoping to be thinking diversely. So, to illustrate this, because I think it's a very, very valid point to appreciate that science is a social process, as well as a process of abstract discovery, uh, to give the best examples I know, which are bees and chess. So let's talk about why chess is relevant. Um, chess, in fact, has a lot of relevant history to what we're discussing. It's been changed by the social context it's been in. So chess originated about 5th century India, and the pieces all have very different names. You have things like elephants, ministers of war, chariots. Then it begins to spread towards the uh, Middle East, and um, it starts to be, uh, be affected by its exposure to the Islamic world. So pieces are named after different kinds of positions. For example, um, there is no queen. There are no female pieces. They are, in fact, um, a much, much, much weaker pieces known as viziers, which is sort of a kind of high-ranking minister. So what changed? How can we have these new very powerful queens? Well, what changed, again, was the context. So, in the 8th century, um, the Arabs introduced chess to Spain. In fact, they sort of introduced themselves to Spain, rather. Um, and chess began to spread around Europe. However, from the 8th century, it takes until the 15th century, you know, roughly 700 years, before we see a first female piece in 1475. That is, the Queen. Now, back then, they were rare things, they were carved, and so the queen was just sort of slouching, just sort of sitting there, not really doing much. But this was a very big change, to suddenly have a queen. Why did that happen? Well, the reason turned out to be an interesting figure, um, Isabella I of Castile, or as we call it, just Queen Isabella I. Um, so she was inaugurated that year, 1475, and, well, the marriage proposed a lot of uh, new things for Spain, effectively with the reunification of Spain and expelling um, the, uh, the Moors who had ruled over so much of Spain for the last few hundred years. But, of course, there was a difference. With this queen, instead of being able to, you know, move the full distance in any direction, 
Instead, she was limited to the rather paltry two. It took 20 years, but that changed. In 1495, 20 years after the appearance of the first female chess piece, um, the same lady again, Queen Isabella I, was the most powerful person in Europe. In fact, she'd already funded Christopher Columbus to go off to America three years earlier, and just about finished conquering, uh, reconquering uh, the last parts of Spain that were still held by the Moors. At this point, she was widely recognised as being more powerful than her husband, the king, even though he was technically more important. And so it's with that you get the standard power imbalance of chess, where the queen, the most powerful piece, but the king is what lets you lose. And so here we can see there's a very clear progression with uh, what people put in the game, and what's reflected by reality. For, you know, a good millennium, you simply do not have any female pieces on chessboards, even as it spreads throughout, until suddenly in 20 years you go from, uh, you go from introducing a piece to having it be the most powerful piece, all because you suddenly have an age of powerful women, and that being the normal thing. Now, this is chess. Let's talk about something more important and more organised. Bees. As Joe, Joni and Nancy at Ask an Entomologist on Twitter point out in a really interesting thread, there is a really long and interesting history behind why we know that the top of the bee hierarchy are made up of queens. Because for many, many years, like 1,400 years or so, we thought they were kings. So, bees as kings really begins with Aristotle. Um, so he was one of the first people, if not the first we have on record, to really talk extensively about honeybees. And as they talk about in the thread, he proposes, you know, quite a few theories. Amongst one, that the uh, bees reproduce by swarming. That is, all the bees fly up, they go buzz, 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 and then... And you get new bee. And also, of course, he makes the observation that there are some bigger bees, and that they are probably the ones that are in charge, that lead, that help go out and make the new hives. And so, it being a long time ago, uh, he proposes to call them king bees. Now, why didn't he think queen bees? Like, they definitely had the technology back then. Uh, you know, 1,700 years ago, to get bees in a container and, you know, look at the queens laying eggs. But, you know, there wasn't much of a scientific method back then. And also, Aristotle was rather sexist. Won't go into it, but he was quite influentially sexist. You know, it appears in a lot of his writings on rhetoric and on politics that he simply couldn't really handle the idea of, you know, women having power. And this did bleed into the fact that, you know, he just by default referred to them as kings, not, and didn't even consider queens. That didn't really fly, as it were. And so, Aristotle is the last word on bees for a good thousand years, until we get to around early 17th century, where we have the book that makes Queen bees are a thing now. They're trendy, they're hip, and it's all down to this guy called Charles Butler who publishes this very, uh, very influential book, The Feminine Monarchy. Now, 1609, Charles Butler had been living under Queen Victoria in England for 41 years at this point, so he was really quite comfortable with the idea of, you know, women having power. There was an odd little caveat with his thing. You see, Queen Victoria was known quite well as the Virgin Queen. And this had consequences for the bee theory, which is that Charles Butler could say, oh yes, yes, the biggest bee, the dominant bee, is female. However, he couldn't imagine that bee 
having sex even. They he thought of them as, you know, kind of virgin queens. Even though, you know, beekeepers knew and had known for, you know, the full thousand years since Aristotle that the queens laid eggs. Some people were still talking about other, you know, you know, the drone bees picking the little bee larva from plants, as if, you know, the queen had nothing to do with it. So there was still this really odd gap because we would to be able to reconcile the idea of, you know, women can, you know, be the dominant ones in structures and then therefore perhaps bees can have queens. But there was still this taboo, this idea of, you know, thinking around, oh dear, what if, can a queen have sex? So that takes another 200 years. It takes until uh, 1806, where a blind beekeeper, Francois Huber, and his assistant uh, begin to actually you know, perform some observations. They put a virgin queen and some drones in a container, and they do mate. However, the queen doesn't lay eggs. But then later, they observe the queen on a mating flight, on warm evenings a few days after, you know, emerging from their vessel. Uh, the queens then fly out to where drones congregate and mate with the drones. And this happens repeatedly until the, until the ovaries are effectively full. And so that's how long it takes us. It takes from around 350, when Aristotle first publishes his theories about king bees, until... 1609, when Charles Butler begins to suggest that the king bees might be queens, and then to 1806, when Francois Huber manages to figure out actually how bees do it. So, if there's a lesson to that video, it's that all scientists are people, some people are scientists, and because scientists live in the real world, the real world has an effect on the science they do. It doesn't happen in its own vacuum. For example, with chess, that's just a fun fact. You have a game, and then you have a very powerful queen, and then you change the game to just show how cool and powerful the powerful queen is. With bees, though, Aristotle, or someone, you know, a thousand years ago, could have easily observed that, you know, the top of the bee chain is a queen bee. But they didn't, because they were held back by ideas. Um, initially by Aristotle's sexism, and then many hundreds of years of people going, oh, you don't want to question Aristotle. You need to have lots of things in your toolbox. You need to try and make fewer assumptions and have more ways of thinking about things. Thinking, living diversely, is really important in producing good science. Otherwise, it holds you back. Also, it's fun. Everything counts, so go try something new, or try something old in a new way. That's why I'm outside, apparently. I've been spending enough time inside, frankly, and it's a beautiful season. Anyway, thanks for watching. Go have fun. Bye. Hi there.